evidence that came into um, our report right first time, I think, lays out some, some of that. Um, it's also about not having um, access to medical reports and medical evidence, but taking it on face-to-face -face very often when it's not actually um, appropriate or um, necessary. Uh, it's also about the contract itself um, being very process-driven rather than looking at the results um, of, of what's happening to those people. Um, as, Just as explain a that a little bit more to me. I'm sorry? Could you explain that a little bit more to us? Well, we're not clear and would like to be clear, and maybe this is a question for later on today, of what the key performance indicators are for the contractor in this contract. But we do believe there are some perverse uh, incentives about going to face-to-face -face assessments where potentially medical evidence could give that assessment and possibly with better evidence over a longer period of time. Um, we also think there might be perverse incentives around people with um, variable conditions and how that is dealt with uh, on a face-to-face. -face. Um, we have also identified that although there are some penalties with, within the contract, that very few of them are exacted upon the contractor for poor performance. Um, and we believe that in terms of inaccuracy, there should be an additional penalty that when cases go to appeal and they are successful based on inaccurate reports and assessments, there should be a penalty there to give an incentive to the contractor for accuracy. I mean, our evidence is, is really based on the high level of appeal successes, which is almost 40% of those actually going to appeal. And about 60% of those go from no points at all in the assessment to um, being awarded ESA. So that's quite a leap. That's not a, a, a fine distinction. And is it different from the previous um, assessment? In terms of how it used to operate, mm. yes, we haven't... I mean, is there a greater... Are there a greater number going to appeal and is there a greater... Uh, uh, success rate for the there is a great There is a greater success rate and a greater span of that success, as I've said, from naught to success is, is quite a significant leap. Um, we also um, have seen a huge increase in the numbers of people coming to us, greater than through incapacity benefit, for advice, both on appeals but also uh, on the initial in assessment, and most alarming because there have been steps taken to try and uh, increase the um, efficiency of the system. Uh, our statistics show that in the last quarter, so July to September 2012, um, the number of people coming to us with ESA problems went up to 112,000, and that's up 68% on the same quarter last year. And the number of people on appeals themselves went up 83% on the same quarter last year. So our concern is that no matter what's being said has been improved, uh, what's coming through our doors uh, as problems to us is actually increasing. So in 11-12 we saw 300,000 people uh, on ESA problems and between the start of ESA and 2012 we've seen 650,000 people. But we don't see any let up, in, indeed we see that increasing. There are many other things, I think, um, that, that both of us could probably um, go into in terms of the detail behind the process, but the key issues for us are about accuracy, not taking the medical evidence, uh, being driven by the wrong uh, end results, uh, that being through process, and not being penalised for poor performance. Thank you very much. Neil, on behalf of the disability organisation, it's very difficult to select who to come, but thank you for coming. No, th thank you for the invitation. I mean, Julia has covered many of the, the, the same bases that we would as a, as a disability rights organisation. Uh, just very quickly agree that you know when ESA was being uh, introduced, lots of disability organisations were saying this should be brilliant. They should actually see better support go to disabled people to deliver you know, work outcomes, actually really change how disabled people viewed that focus on capability rather than inability, if you like. Um, uh, but the delivery has been abysmal. We've, we are inundated. We have, I mean, Jean's given us since advice figures, we have something like 170, 180,000 people using just our online materials. Uh, the impact on disabled people, their families, disa local disabled people's organisations, the tribunal service. Just again to make a comparison, 170 to 180,000 since the ESA, no, under the old IB. This is just this year. We would not, we would not have seen 
uh, anywhere near that level for incapacity benefit under Disability Alliance as well as Disability Rights UK only formed this year. So um, the, and the, the level of uh, concern coming from our members' organisations as well. We have uh, you know, routine sessions with Department for Work and Pensions. We've had uh, local organisations uh, come in to talk about the impact in terms of e even, even the most tragic of circumstances where people are believed to have taken their own lives as a result of being found either fully fit for work and losing resources or, or other support, the knock-on knock -on effect. Um, and, and the frustration that, that uh, including from, you know, the National Audit Office report makes clear that you know, the poor risk or issue risk uh, escal escalation was highlighted in that report. Well, citizens of violence, disability organisations have been saying from the word go that there are significant problems with both the descriptors, the communications, the process, the medical information, as, as Gillian's highlighted, that is, is having this massively detrimental effect on, effect on disabled people, on advice organisations, but also on, on public finances. We're looking at about £80 million worth of avoidable uh, public expenditure. To put that in, in perspective, that could find more than 10,000 disabled people in work through access to work and make a contribution to the economy. At the time, disabled people are facing cuts to social care, cuts to other benefits. It's the, the, the dismissal of this as a significant area of, of public policy concern has been incredibly damaging. And, and I, I should add, a, I suppose, a final thank you to you for highlighting this and the National Order of, uh, National Order of Report for highlighting what is a massive failure in public policy that, if it was replicated anywhere else, would probably have seen heads roll. Mm. <laughs> it is replicated elsewhere. Well, can I ask, uh, <laughs> have you been consistent in that view? I mean, what were you saying before uh, this came along? I mean, what did you? What was your uh, Miss Guy has said that she doesn't have a philosophical, uh, from the CAB point of view, uh, opposition to the involvement in private sector companies, um, and that the scheme per se is that, has that always been your position? When, when uh, I mean, when ESA was introduced, I was still at the Disability Rights Commission, so it's a slightly different perspective. But there were, as I say, lots of disability organisations and. Um, philosophically, me personally, I suppose, would say, yes, we want to see a, a better delivery of employment support so that disabled people actually get into work. But the, the work ability assessment is only one part of that, obviously, and we're actually seeing, um, if you want to see it in the bigger picture, we're not seeing the kind of delivery into work that w was estimated when uh, ESA was being established. And, of, of course, the economic downturn is, is a factor in that, but there are... Uh, significant problems around how the work capability assessment is working that have contributed. So I, in my constituency I had over a thousand people in 2011 who had been parked on various benefits for over 10 years. Were you, you know, why did organisations like you, yours and others never persuade the previous government to enter into any kind of thorough ongoing programme to tackle that? endemic problem, which is bad for them and bad for society and bad for government. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I, perhaps I didn't explain fully. Disability Rights UK and other disability organisations I've worked for definitely support better support going to save people to prevent that parking. And actually, parking people and benefits obviously has longer term health uh, it can have longer uh, health uh, complications, including depression. The longer you're out of work, the more, more likely you are to develop depression, for example. We have campaigned for better access to support to get into work, including things like access to work, and it's one of the reasons we, Disability Rights UK, has um, you know, welcomed the Minister for Disabled People's statement today on access to work and some of the changes there. We'd like to see better awareness, but actually we, we do support so people getting better support. We don't believe the work capability assessment is delivering that because it's failing to identify uh, impairments and health conditions and their impact routinely. OK, can I just... I, I know it's a big piece of work, but can I just have your um, general observations on a Harrington Review, your organisation, and perhaps this guy as well? I think you know, we've welcomed Harrington, uh, Professor Harrington's work uh, in the past. It's been um, limited in scope, if you want to look at how the WCA actually works in, in terms of the fuller process of trying to get people into work. Um, we would like to see the Harrington recommendations implemented. I think when we looked at the last two rounds, and obviously we know there's more tomorrow, when we looked at the last two rounds, only about a third had been implemented. And in particular, the, the need to link up uh, you know, the front communications, if you like, to part of what explaining to individuals what's going to happen. 
uh, and, and the role of advice organisations like both of ours play in that. And at the back end, the, 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 the link between the tribunal and the uh, original assessment and why there is such a significant difference, it is, I think, unacceptable just to say we'll keep burying 50, 60, 70 million pounds worth of, uh, of cost for tribunals when, with a bit more information sharing, uh, that cost could have been avoided and the assessment could have been done better first time. Okay, I've got Austin and Justin. And, oh, uh, sorry. Gillian. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, Gillian, I'd like to briefly say that we have welcomed Harrington and would welcome any review that makes this process more effective and more efficient. Uh, if the recommendations aren't fully implemented, though, it has limited uh, ability to succeed. I think the other thing is to, to say that just because there's been a review and just because there are those recommendations, that doesn't stop other organisations such as the ones represented here from having some significant evidence from the people who actually um, go through this process that ought to be taken into account as well. So we'd like to see um, us being taken into the DWP with Harrington and actually saying what should happen in order to make this more effective and stop parking and all of those other things that we, we see happening to our clients. I'm sure Mr Devereux will be listening to your words. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to see in a bit. Um, Austin, then Justin. Can you give us your views on the adequacy of the medical examination? I mean, we get a negative view as MPs, so... But the people who have been coming to me, and I must say there's a lot more of them, uh, complain that uh, it isn't really a medical examination at all, it's a kind of tick box thing, uh, that it's very perfunctory. Uh, and I always advise them to go to appeal, and I notice on the appeal figures, 38% of the, of the appeals uh, sustain the applicant, say they're not fit for work. So this indicates that, to me that the medical examination is not uh, adequate. Um, clearly the assessment itself is failing very many disabled people. There are still people coming to us who on the uh, initial assessment score zero points uh, but go on to, uh, on appeal, uh, end up in the, the ESA support group. So clearly, clearly big failures. Most recently we had a uh, local organisation in terms of someone with uh, incontinence, total incontinence, no, uh, no ability to control uh, bowel or bladder, and yet they were found fit for work. Um, that, that clearly should not have happened. There are, there are definitely problems there. We think some of the, you know, the time slot available, the qualifications of the assessors are relevant, but also the, there, is, there is clearly a failure to collect that independent medical evidence in advance. And the Department for Work and Pensions' uh, choice to reduce the time frame for that from six weeks to four weeks uh, unilaterally without any consultation, any explanation for why that was happening, is likely to have had a detrimental effect on disabled people's ability to get that information in advance. Uh, I mean, I don't know how often you, I'm sure you're all fit and healthy and, and, and wonderfully active, but if you need to see your GP, it can take uh, two weeks just to get an appointment. If you have multiple conditions and need to see a consultant, uh, you know, through your GP referral, then four weeks simply is not enough. And we would, as Disability Rights UK, we would support some of our members' uh, view that there, need to, there needs to be a requirement to get that ESA uh, 50 filled in in advance and there needs to be better information sharing from DWP on existing uh, things like you know if, 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 if it's someone coming from incapacity benefit there will be a bank of information if you like from former assessments that could be used to uh, you know make an educated guess if you like about whether this person needs a face to face assessment or not and it is basically a tick, tick box thing and uh, which they can tick and a point kind of thing we, yeah, which, we, which indicates that it, it's fairly simplistic and perfunctory Yes, people definitely tell us that they, they go through it very quickly, they feel it's tick box, there are lots of people with in particular rare or fluctuating conditions uh, who, who feel, who've even asked. I think we had, we've had people with dystonia, people with um, aphasia who've said that they've asked the assessor if they've even heard of their condition, they've said no. Um, so, so there are uh, significant issues there. Sorry, Julian, no problem. That's, that's fine. I, I think the, the statistics on the appeals pretty much speak for themselves, that this cannot be an accurate and robust system if the, this number of appeals are being allowed. Uh, it's also, I think, a question of uh, what gets measured gets managed. Uh, so <laughs> if it's about throughput, then it's going to be a very quick process and it's not going to detain itself with looking thoroughly at medical evidence. Mm. The other thing is medical evidence is not in the moment. It actually has a history to it. So it's really important to go back to medical advisors and those who know the claimant and understand their situation. 
is particularly an issue where it's a variable condition. So if you hit a good day or a bad day for your assessment, that will make a considerable difference. Uh, and we have cases where people don't recognise themselves in the report yes. if they do indeed right. see the report, as of course is not, not their right. They don't necessarily understand what's in there. The other uh, point is that these assessments can be used further down the line. So even if people qualify for ESA, they may come to their disability living allowance assessment and find that the report can act to their detriment there. And again, they may not recognise themselves. So this has quite a profound effect apart from the emotional effect that it has on people, given the amount of delay there is before they even get what is quite a perfunctory assessment. Can I just come back on that? Um, so you're, you're saying, are you saying that the most problematic cases are where there's comorbidities of physical and, and mental health? Or are you saying that there's, uh, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you perhaps saying that m mental health issues are more difficult to spot and that... Uh, and, and therefore, does that give rise to higher uh, levels of appeal success well, I, in I'm, your experience? I, well, I'm not a practitioner, so no. I couldn't, couldn't fully say that. What I would say is it's not just mental health issues that sometimes display themselves or don't display themselves depending upon the timing of the assessment. So if it's variable, whether it be physical or mental, then there is a danger that there could be an isolated assessment that is not accurate. And I think the NAO report picked up uh, an intimation of uh, regional differences. In your experience, your uh, mm. advisors, would you say that's the case, that there is a, a regional disparity on, on these assessments? We pick up differences which um, happen in regions, but I wouldn't claim that they are regional differences. And that, that, that's a nicety because it's not sufficient research based on the region. It just happens to be different in different you, When you look at that NAO uh, figure, I can't remember, somebody pointed out to me, it looks absolutely Bristol, uh, appear, Bristol area appears to um, uh, uh, perform at outrageously badly in terms of just and doing boot, assessments in time. Brutal as well. All of them. I mean, there's a whole load down to Manchester are only doing half in time. Yes. Mm. What is it, page? Uh, page 22, yeah, yeah. it's figure six. That, that doesn't come up in your case work. Mm. I, I should point out, Chair, this, this is actually the customers sent home unseen regional variances. Yeah. The what? The customers sent home unseen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So the issue we're talking about, we, we don't have okay. evidence to yeah. pick that up. That's strong right. enough. Justin. Well, that, that was actually the first point. I was going to refer to that chart, uh, based on experience. But the other particular area is that in the report, it seems to imply that one area they do do well on is dealing with complaints within 20 days. So I'd appreciate your experience of that. Is it that they are doing so in a comprehensive and satisfactory manner, or is it somewhat superficial just to meet that deadline? I don't know if you, you, you say to me, but I, I did ask a little bit of information from the Department of Work and Pensions on this, um, admittedly only last week, about how did appear actually monitoring that, because it would be good to go into a bit more detail, and hopefully you'll, you'll get more from the uh, Permanent Secretary, but I didn't get anything in advance. It was just, and actually there, I think uh, it would be helpful if advice and disability organisations were actually built into sort of the complaint monitoring. Uh, because again, if you, if you don't identify a problem, if you don't acknowledge there's a problem, it's very difficult to address that and make the financial savings that I'm sure uh, everyone uh, sat around the table would like to see. And, and one further point, you mentioned dystonia, and there's a number of other illnesses that are not particularly common, so it's not perhaps unexpected that an, an assessor or any <coughs> medical person would not necessarily pick that up on the first time. Are you finding from your experience of, of dealing with people who have not been picked up that this is relatively common? and that therefore they have no choice but to go through the appeals process because the knowledge wasn't there and there isn't the ability to pause the system. It, it is, <clears throat> I think, partly about the individual assessors, and I think you, you wouldn't just get regional variation. You'd actually get even, uh, even within one assessment centre, you could have two people with relatively similar conditions go in and get a very different uh, assessment. It's, it's you know, based on the, 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 the qualifications of the assessor. Um, the... There are, just from the contact that we have, member organisations as well as individual to say people would say yes, there is a, there is a lack of um, awareness of particular conditions and, and the impact of those conditions, particularly over the long term, and Jim's already made the point about fluctuating conditions, so ME, MS are also relevant. I think that the, in terms of recommendations and where 
the path working pensions might like to go is I think Australia has a slightly different system in that it looks at sort of reliably, safely performing tasks on a sustainable basis, which is a better link to work as well. So it, it could be that uh, the next review or the, or the next independent review, it won't be Professor Harrington, but whoever undertakes that could actually look at uh, more international models, better uh, identification of conditions. But one final point on that is the, had ESA 50s been better used, that form that is supposed to be filled in with independent medical evidence in advance, then there is no excuse for the assessor not having uh, an awareness of a particular condition. Because at, at this stage, if, if you come to me and I'm an assessor mm -hmm. and I don't fully understand that particular can I pause the process or do I have to just make an educated guess as an assessor? You, you, you would make a recommendation to put on for work and pensions based on what you've seen on that time slot mm -hmm. and uh, ask the individual to provide more information to part for work and pensions. So if I had had advanced knowledge... I could have then sought the information. Yeah, you may not even need to yeah. see the individual. And, and bear in mind, um, Atos, I don't believe, uh, certainly from the, from the NAO report, still don't seem to be meeting, I think it's 15,000 a week target. It was only 14,000 something last year. There are people who have been seen, who, avoidably, who, who, who may not actually need a face to face assessment. There are also this group of people, growing group of people who are contacting us saying, despite being in the support group, they're being called in every six months for a new assessment. Now, if ATOS aren't meeting the 15,000, why are people going through this revolving door of assessment despite uh, needs and the impact of uh, an impairment health condition unlikely to have changed? Um, Jackie, then Peter. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around whether it's the, the, the holes are in the actual process followed or in the execution, mm. really, because it, it, certainly the people, um, I heard what Julian, you said earlier on, but so the people who come through my doors with, with issues. They tell me stories about how the fact that the report they get doesn't bear any you know, examination compared with the experience they went through and that effectively there's a lot of form filling. But according to the report in paragraph 3.9, um, less than 5% of, of assessments fail the professional standard. What's your observation on that and how does it feel to you? Is it operational <coughs> execution or is it a flaw in the process? I think the, the first point to make is that less than 5% conceals a very large number. Yeah. Um, so it's 5% of what that's important. Yeah. Um, and that's not a good place to be in terms of uh, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And I think that's the term used, which is also not particularly measuring uh, the quality. I, the other thing to say is it's probably a mixture. Um, I, I suspect there are, there are bits in the contract that could be tightened up. And indeed, um, with PIP, some of these lessons appear to have been taken forward, including the um, necessity for the assessors to have taken the med medical evidence. Mm -hmm. So it feels as if you know, th there, there is an evolving uh, learning going on here that I don't see why it couldn't be applied retrospectively. Um, so in the contract, we've, we've spoken about where are the incentives, what are the, the key indicators, what's driving the performance of this, um, and also uh, where is the decision-making taken, I think, is an important point. So when we looked at decision-makers, um, we seem to see they're getting uh, less empowered as we go through the process rather than more, um, so that the initial assessment becomes more critical. Uh, because if it's being rubber stamped, if I can use that term, then obviously it's critical to get it right in the first place. When we talk about accuracy, then that's got to be the people sitting there doing the assessment. Uh, and if, if there's reasons that they haven't got the time to be accurate, which is you know, something we might want to, to delve into, then that's a, another issue with the contract. But overall, I think it's a mixture of the design of the service and its execution. Mm -hmm. I have to say that generally, it really doesn't matter to the claimants whether it's the contract or its execution. What matters is yeah. the impact on those people. Yeah. Yeah. And if the DWP, as in this case, happens to be the person pulling the strings, then the responsibility has to lie there to get it right. Indeed. And what ministers have focused on is actually improving the process. Um, do you think that is the most important tool, or is it really scrutiny about delivery that will actually deal with the, uh, those claims of having very negative outcomes? I, I think it's both, but I don't know any contract manager anywhere that doesn't require both to have stipulations in the contract for what they need and then monitor and make sure that it's being performed. You don't have one without the other. And I don't know if I could just feed in very quickly 
5% clearly masks uh, the bigger problem that is around communications. There are many people who do appeal who don't have a case. Uh, you know, they, 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 they do not overturn the initial recommendation. Um, so there's a communications issue there for, on the part of the Department for Committee about what has changed. And it is that change from parking people on a particular benefit into something that's meant to be more supportive and meant to focus on capabilities. But if, if there was only a 5% problem, then we probably wouldn't have seen the British Medical Association and GMC stepping in and raising concerns about this particular process and the, sort of professional, uh, the need for professionalism within, within the assessments. And if things were improving, we wouldn't see year on year rising demand for both our organisations, uh, backlog in appeals rising, more people actually being recruited to hold those appeals, and Department for Work and Pension estimates like half a million appeals this year and rising further. I'm going to bring you two in, but just a follow-up from that, from both of you, you've, got, you've both got big caseloads of people coming to you on this. Have you, have you got a feel for what proportion of people are too frightened to take it to the appeal process? We tend to hear, obviously, we tend to hear from people who feel that the process has gone wrong already. Um, so there's perhaps a, an, an imbalance in some of the, the coverage. But I think more, there is a nervousness amongst many of our members, in particular frontline advisors, around the requirement that for reconsideration before appeal, I think that's causing probably more more concern because there are there is a, a belief that particularly because of the nature of some of the conditions of the disabled people affected, people will assume they're being told they can't appeal rather than being told it might be better if you go through the reconsideration. And of course members are suggesting that uh, reconsideration isn't the best option for disabled people because you don't get paid at the same benefit rate. Okay, I'm going to get Gita and then call this Can bit to an end. Oh, yeah, go on. I'm just going to add that I think, I think the number that might be more alarming is the people that don't come to us. Yeah. Because once they enter um, through the door for some advice, yeah. they, they, they have a sort of yeah. predisposition to complain. Yeah. And we'd encourage them. Yeah. Um, my first question actually is um, to the Citizen Advice Bureau. Um, you did mention at the outset some figures in relation to a 68% increase in um, people coming to you and 83% increase in, in appeals. Could you, could, you, could you give us some background or context to the numbers going through the system? Because clearly, if there are more going through the system, then you'd expect more to be coming to CAB at some point. Well, what, what we do know is that when we compare it with incapacity benefit and the numbers of people are not changing significantly, um, it's, it's about ten times the number we are seeing dropping off through incapacity benefit coming through ESA. So it's, it's not proportionate. Not proportionate. So in, in effect, the, the, the clearly there's something wrong with the system so in your view. That's the, the second point I'd like to make is we, we've talked a lot, about, a lot about the appeal system. Now, when I've asked ministers about this issue, they've argued quite um, strongly that the appeals system is part of the process. So the question I would ask you in effect is, if, if a 38% appeal success rate is clearly indicating a problem, what sort of level of appeals would you expect to be acceptable in terms of there is a system, there will be an appeal, because in any system you'd have to have an appeal process. What would be seen as acceptable to yourselves? I'm reluctant to be drawn on a figure that would be acceptable. I think the issue for us is what are the grounds of the appeal that yeah. make them successful? And if they're going from no points in an assessment to being successful, that hints at a very large problem. If there are marginal shifts and people will always have the right and, and might want to appeal in marginal shifts, that's a different point. And I think that's the critical point for us in understanding that this, there's really something fundamentally uh, at issue before they get to that appeal. But that's quite a good question. You, you deal with, CAB deals with all sorts of tribunals. Um, uh, are there, is there a greater success rate here are there other, you know, other areas of uh, social security or whatever where um, you, you feel that the original system works better and therefore fewer people are successful in appeal? Just look at it comparatively to the other work that you do at the CAB. Well, to, in order to give you accurate figures, I'd have to go away and, and produce well, those for you. Um, give us a feel. It, well, I'm, I'm giving you a gut feel, really, um, yeah. before I get that evidence, and, and this feels like a high percentage. I mean, if it was around 10%, 15%, uh, with the, the caveat that it depends on the grounds for that, um, that would feel more comfortable. And I, I don't think it's <coughs> reasonable to conclude that the appeals should be seen as part of this, given that people feel penalised and let down before they even get to the appeal. It's that initial recommendation that, that causes significant concern for families. 
the, the, and of course there is an additional cost. It, you know, the, the payment to the Ministry of Justice for the appeals process should be taken into account as part of this. I think in terms of where we'd like to see a sort of baseline, uh, again, I'd, I'd have to go away and get statistics to compare with other benefits, but where we see such consistent failure, consistent appeal rates, consistently overturned decisions, that should be more of a, more of a concern. And to, to make a, a quick analogy, you know, the, the, the level of failure, as you took at one in seven of the uh, original, initial recommendations being overturned at appeal, uh, the G4S Olympic fiasco was based on the failure to deliver 17% of what was a one-off contract. Well, this contract is failing beyond that year on year, and yet we don't see the same swift action to tackle that waste of public money. Okay. And just one final question to Mr Coyle, really. Um, one of the issues I come across in my constituency surgeries is a lot of people who claim that they have been refused a, a home visit, so obviously they, they have been asked to attend a face-to-face visit, they've asked for a home visit. Do you have any figures in relation to uh, people who feel that they've been uh, let down by the system because they've been refused that sort of home visit? No, we don't. I mean, there is, it's, it's good news that the government is, is looking at, uh, for PIP assessments, more home visits. That's, that's very welcome. Um, and it has been a problem for some. I wouldn't have a figure off that. I can try and get, get into those figures. But there is, I mean, that alongside broader um, concerns here is around, you know, the Department for Work and Pensions has obligations under the Equality Act to make reasonable adjustments to this public function. That should be passed on to ATOS. That should include things like communicating with disabled people in a way that is, is you know, is accessible, so a bit braille for a blind person, whatever it might be, easy read for someone with a learning difficulty. Uh, the same for home visit. Home visit should be based on uh, someone who cannot reasonably be expected to use public transport, for example. And we have heard uh, cases like this, and I believe that there is a uh, there is some uh, scope for some, uh, legally challenging how this is being delivered, but it's unclear. Uh, right now, whether the Department of Work and Pensions has passed on all of those uh, obligations, requirements to make adjustments to, to ATOS. Fiona, very last question. Specifically, on that question about passing on the responsibilities of government <coughs> under the disability discrimination legislation when government, when public functions are being carried out by a private company, are you telling us that private companies carrying out public functions don't automatically? bring with them the responsibilities to comply with disability discrimination and other equalities legislation? Well, they should, but it's, it's about where, whether it, I mean, it's not, not, not in this report, it's not, not something that has had enough of a focus and will probably take a test case to, to identify who is ultimately responsible based on it being failure to have a home visit, failure to provide uh, an accessible letter up front to explain the process or uh, a reasonable adjustment at the point of the assessment. Okay, thank you so much. That's been really, really helpful. And we will now attempt to take some of those issues up with the uh, permanent secretary. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. But I also have to say to you that if at the end of today we feel that we need uh, more uh, information and a better response, we will be calling them on another occasion. Good. Um,